Welcome to another edition of Expanding Mind. I'm your host, Eric Davis, continuing our conversations about the cultures of consciousness. Just a little uh, housekeeping. It, it seems to be working. My, uh, my near, nearly weekly request for some uh, reviews on iTunes or wherever um, you listen to your podcasts. Uh, I'm trying to get the word out a little bit more, so tell your friends. I think we have a special show here, and I'd like more people to tune into it. I did get some uh, mail feedback. Uh, one person, one of the big questions, of course, is how long the show is. Some people love the uh, de well-defined hour length. Some people uh, want longer, and I'm going to try to square the circle when I, I set up my, uh, my pa Patreon so that I'll be able to have uh, additional conversations with people uh, after uh, interviewing them for the full hour. Uh, so you, those will be like extra goodies for the for the faithful. Um, I also got a critical response uh, from uh, a, a someone I've been communicating with a fair amount. He thought that my conversation with uh, Douglas Rushkoff a couple of weeks ago uh, was um, uh, he said he, he 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 felt that there was an avoidance rather than an acknowledgement embrace of the key threats to humanity. Uh, and because of that, what could have been an enlightening and necessarily intense conversation. <laughs> about that shared dilemma veered into a kind of coded language that was too vague to be truly bracing or mind expanding. And uh, that I took, he went on, he had, he had good reasons for putting his point of view. And I, I've thought about this issue a lot because I, I sometimes listen to people who are inflamed by the urgency of our moment, by the, all of the apocalyptic signs on the, uh, not just even on the horizon, but in our uh, everyday and, and the sense of urgency uh, which kind of pushes beyond the normal protocol of kind of casual conversations or sort of respecting the other person's point of view and, and, and things that are much more temperamentally suited to me. I'm, I'm not a firebrand. I've never been a firebrand. Um, and while I can be faulted for that, and I fault myself to some degree uh, for sometimes not standing up for things that I believe in more intensely because I have a diplomatic, open-minded, conversational kind of mind, um, I also believe that uh, lots of folks are doing that. Uh, and if you're listening to podcasts, if you're paying attention, then I hope that some of the people you're paying attention to are, are very unwavering in their sense of uh, what the issues are, what the biggest problems are, how urgent some of these problems are. Uh, and to my mind, uh, we, you know, we're all part of the ferment. And just because you're not necessarily completely you know, pounding the, the, the table, uh, about species extinction or incipient war or surveillance capitalism or the you know growing nationalism and xenophobia and climate change and you know we're all kind of unfortunately familiar with this litany uh, it doesn't mean that I'm not passionately invested in certain outcomes and passionately resistant uh, to a lot of uh, contemporary society it's just that I approach it with a, a, a different a different strategy which may or may not be effective in the long run but I think works for some people uh, and doesn't work uh, for others but it was a it, it was a very good um, uh, question so in any case also I just wanted to throw out one more time the a uh, uh, voicemail number at PRN, the Progressive Radio Network, which of course has hosted my show for, mm. for uh, nine years now. Uh, and that number is 866-800-6805, 862-800-6805. So if you want to call and leave a, a message there, that's great. So uh, recently we had a show where we talked to Jason Louv, who, who wrote a wonderful book about John D. Uh, and of course, we, if you're interested in the matter of John Dee and really the whole tradition of angel magic and the way that it transforms into 20th century occultism, you have to kind of deal with this fundamental issue of like, who are these guys, these angels, these devils? Uh, is there a difference between them? Are they in us? Are they in the, the structure of the cosmos? Um, and so it kind of brought up this sort of questions that, that Jason and I didn't go into too, too much. We were talking about other matters. Uh, but it was sort of lingering in the air, this kind of ongoing question about how do we think about these others? Uh, you know, we started off this year's podcast with a two-parter with, with Diana Pasoka about uh, UFOs and aliens and extraterrestrials. So that's another form of this question about higher intelligence. And then I realized uh, that for a forthcoming show, we'll be doing in a couple of weeks um, about the American poet James Merrill's great book, 
the Changing Light at Sandover, which which is uh, is is made up in a large part of communications that he and his uh, partner received through the Ouija board over a, a decades long period of time uh, that is very far out, very cosmological, even though he's a very, uh, you know, a feat and highbrow poet. But we'll, we'll talk about Merrill later. But in rereading his book, which I hadn't read since my 20s, early 20s, uh, which is astounding. Um, I, once again, uh, one of the major themes is how these, this poet and his partner think about these entities who are coming through the Ouija board. Are they real? Are they part of uh, their own minds? There's discussion of collective intelligence. There's discussions of extraterrestrials, of God forms, of devils, of angels. And there's just this whole kind of question of higher intelligence in that form. So these things have all been bubbling around my mind. And, and uh, you know, we talked last year to, to Anthony Blake. Um, and we had a wonderful open-ended conversation. He's a, he's a great fan of this kind of open-ended uh, conversation where we proceed with uh, a sense of wonder and negative capability rather than a sense of conviction and argument. Um, and he brings this intelligence to bear on uh, through a number of his books, uh, the most recent and probably most in, uh, formidable of which is A Gymnasium of Beliefs. And, you know, believe me, folks, I, I almost always read everything that the person or, you know, the whole book, if I'm talking to someone who wrote a book, uh, I might skim a little bit, you know, move a little fast over certain parts I'm familiar with, but I, it's one of my, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's something I'm devoted to as someone interviewing writers, and a lot of interviewers don't do that, and you can tell, and it's dumb, so I'm going to read the book. In this case, I'm being completely open that I have not read this book, because I feel like I need to be kind of on a mountaintop. Uh, with like a daily meditation and yoga practice, eating, uh, you know, uh, vegan food uh, to, to really be able to, rec to receive it. It will happen. <laughs> but I'm, that's not going to hold me back uh, because uh, it's such a good uh, time talking to Anthony um, that we're going to pluck around some of the same ideas because this book, A Gymnasium of Beliefs in Higher Intelligence, is, in higher intelligence is all about this issue, both our own higher intelligence and the forms that higher intelligence have taken in mythology and in science and uh, in technology. Um, so we're going to dive right in. Anthony, thanks so much for uh, for joining me again on Expanding Mind. All right, to uh, roll up our sleeves, <laughs> <laughs> and dive line. right in. <laughs> yeah, and all those kind of metaphors is quite a formidable, in a way, introduction to um, all of this. Uh, I think I'm going to start with. Uh, uh, feeling, I was feeling orientation that we have a question like uh, higher intelligence, and uh, first impulse is to make it something very big and and high and far, <coughs> so to speak. Uh, you know, maybe into to speculate, uh, but I want to try and begin uh, just with uh, ourselves. Uh, and uh, feelings about ourselves because these so much color our understanding the way we try to make sense of uh, higher possibilities or different possibilities. And even though what I'm going to try and do is, is, is going to be done very poorly, I think it's, it's I always think it's, uh, as you know, I think I mentioned it in our last uh, conversation, my English teacher at school got me very enthused about this saying of G.K. Chesterton, that if a job is worth doing, it's worth doing badly. In other words, if it's a job that's worth doing, how we do it is secondary. Is this the job that's worth doing? That's the idea. Uh, had a wonderful English master. Anyway, it's this, and that is, I sit down, I'm here in front of you, and I think, well, where does my mind come from? Uh, where does my seeing come from? Uh, I like to start with these questions, even if I can't answer them. Uh, and to add here a, a reference to my teacher, Bennett, about this, about intelligence, he had a remarkable take on it, or an unusual take about it. He said, intelligence is a substance. And when it comes into us, we are intelligent, but if it doesn't come into us, we are not intelligent. Now, this is quite contrary to the usual view, which says, okay, we people are jolly 
intelligent creatures and go around doing things. And so ideas of higher intelligence are largely a bit of indulgence and a little bit of extra, a bit of, sup, a, bit of, a, bit of a super us. Uh, but he had a different view altogether. He said people uh, are not really intelligent at all. It's just when this substance comes into them. Now, another form of that was in, I'm going away from the immediacy of my experience now, is in uh, uh, the traditional thinking of Giambattista Vico. I've always been impressed by him, as you know, he, he influenced James Joyce a lot. And he always averred that people were not intelligent, language was intelligent. So in a way, we could start with here's a hypothesis, I'm speaking to you, and people don't ask either, usually. Well, they have some kind of pseudo scientific explanation. Where does language come from? And they think it's a pseudo question, but I don't. I think it's very, very important because this language enables us to be intelligent. What does that mean? It enables us because you and I can converse. And at a distance, we can create something. And this is extraordinary. It's only possible through language. So language is the really intelligent part of our conversation, if you don't mind me saying so. <laughs> no, very much. No, you've already you've already struck many many bells uh, in me, and I'm to, I think I'll respond with with two. One, one to sort of mirror your beginning with uh, our actual situation right now in in the body in this moment in in my apparent awakeness and ability to converse with you. <laughs> There's all this going on that I, I of course have absolutely nothing to do with. I have no responsibility for the capacity of my eyes to see, of the breathing that's going on, mostly not to my awareness, mm -hmm. uh, of the, the brightness and freshness of the living moment and how that kind of energizes wow. whatever else I'm, I'm doing. And it, it's actually kind of remarkable because as humans, we have, in that sense, an immediate obvious example of something like, if not higher intelligence, then at least super intelligence, <laughs> because I certainly don't know how to do anything like that. And so we're here immediately, if we pay attention to our experience and what we're responsible for and what we're not responsible for, we already have evidence just in this moment of this extraordinary life process that is so much larger and in some ways much more intelligent than my own you know, intellect, my own personality, my own perception. And I just want to mention one idea that came up in, in, in another recent podcast with a permaculturist, a visionary permaculturist named Delvin Sulkinson. And he was talking about how, how screwed up our ideas about nature are because from his perspective, nature is just like a super advanced technology far <laughs> beyond our human technology. It's, a, it's incredibly efficient, it's incredibly productive, incredibly creative, it's coming up with new forms. It might move somewhat slowly, but it's you know, it's an extremely robust piece, and we don't usually think about it. We think of it as the background, the past, the old stuff, and now we're like building up higher levels of intelligence moving forward because of our human intellects. But there's a, right there, you just go, wait a second, I'm in this incredible world. I have these incredible capacities. I'm not responsible for any of it. So there's some higher intelligence animating this moment, you know, right, right here and now. Yeah, well, that's, that's you said in your remarks at the beginning, it's just so much spins in, in, into the air, sparkles for us. And this is ex extremely important. It's, because there's been this change of attitude towards nature, which is slightly encouraging, um, I, which I mean that uh, in our developing civilization, you know, for a time period, it was treated as almost... Um, as a contradiction of words, but inanimate. It was like had no uh, will of its own, its no intelligence, no sentience of its own. And uh, I've often gone back to, you know, to the 17th century where remarkable discoveries were made, like the circulation of blood. How? Through the use of vivisection, you know, operating on living animals. And why was it okay? Because animals didn't have any soul. Uh, and so you could do what you liked with it. And actually you could do what you liked with nature because it had no soul. Only we have soul. And you know, this was extended in that period so that women didn't have souls either. And that attitude still persists in, in some respects. But now we're, it's a, I think it's so pleasing now that at least we can do things like appreciate, you know, actually when scientists began to admit, yes, your dog and cat can actually 
have emotions. And that was a great breakthrough. It wasn't all that long ago that happened. And now even though they're accepting the trees can think and, and all this kind of thing. So we're entering a new phase of communication with nature. And of course, it leads to Gaia. And as you know, Gaia, and then, well, we haven't got time for you to go into the, the background of ideas that are remarkable Russian Vernatsky and his, his, his deep ideas about the nature of intelligence and the biosphere. But I want to just um, stop with uh, an aspect of this nature since you raised it. Because uh, Gurdjieff had the phrase great nature and he, he had this you know, very light um, appreciation of great nature as a, some kind of uh, presiding intelligence and so on. But Bennett went further in this and I'm going to throw it in uh, this is you've provoked it in me, and that is he had the idea of what he called unconditioned nature. Uh, you can uh, treat nature and life as, uh, as the, I think you, the reference you made just now implied as a kind of superior um, computer or, or, or apparatus or something like this, but there's, uh, there's always uh, something behind this, something which was, uh, it's because that you can look at nature as, as something achieved and established, but there's another part of nature which is what is not yet there, which mm. is almost like the vacuum pulling. And you can ask naive questions like, uh, what's evolution about? You say evolution is a suction, <laughs> so out, out of the void. It's like, and he had this image, a word from Sufism called Lahut. He translated as the unfathomable and he talked about sucking on the teats of the lachut, this, and it's on the teats of this nothingness, uh, because it's only from nothingness you could get this impelling pull to, which would draw evolution out, and they suddenly catch it in a moment, and I see all these forms drawn out of the surface of the earth, you know, it's climbing and moving and singing and, and get that sort of thing. So, and the unconditioned nature, and I, I'm putting it in because it's on my mind, now about he was connected with his own what he took his own sacred mission which was to look at forms of worship which would work in this time and a new sacred image and his new sacred image would be um, the unconditioned nature which has resonances of course with Mary and uh, all that uh, resurrection yeah of what yeah what it what it makes me think of is, uh, again, just um, in, in with meditation or with you know work with consciousness. When you get to a place where you're not doing anymore, and the language machine isn't isn't really coming up very much, maybe a little burble in the background, like a bubbling brook, but. Uh, not really engaging the consciousness in, 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 in its crafting. And I, and I want to come back to language very much. Uh, it, it, you had introduced I hope so. But to finish this thought, which is less about language, uh, one discovers sometimes um, a kind of freshness that is also nothing or uh, pure potential, perhaps. Um, and so that even in the mind, even in our own experience, we can taste a little bit of that uncondi unconditional mind, which is different than unconditional love, although it's related, I think, to that ability to, to hold the heart open regardless of any content, regardless of reactivity. It's very difficult to do. But I think also in, in, in mind, uh, we can taste that. But then if we brought, make it broader and we look at it as a part of a cosmological principle, then we, then we get the sense of the, the, the way that the evolution of forms and even you know, all of the habits of nature, all of the, the forms, all of the engineered, constructed, repetitious, evolving processes, this iterative weaving that has been going on for, for you know, millions of years, that it's almost like at the front edge of it, is something extremely different, this unconditioned nature that is yeah, open and potential. <laughs> and we can, we can resonate with that. And my sense is a, one of the ways you approach the issue of higher intelligence is that it has to do with developing the capacity to be within or to 
to merge with or to encounter that unconditioned nothingness that is also woven into our experience. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes, indeed. I, I was listening to a reminder, another association, another character, Rudolf Steiner, is he was very attuned to this. He talked about, you know, because they are usual mentation is around will as pushing, you know, so there's a sense of forces and pushing. And he said this, this other world, the spiritual world, is about pulling. You're being pulled, you know. And uh, the, our response to that has to be, I found it myself, has to be cultivated. Again, I'm referring to Bennett. Um, I rely on his words and because he was, he brought into words many things, very important things. <clears throat> and his just straightforward acknowledgement of the, well, it's not only these two, but you know, there's both the active will and the receptive will. And it's the way the receptive will is far more intelligent, if I might put it that way, than the active will. Because the active will can only start from what you know, so to speak. The receptive will can, it sort of starts with what you don't know, which is very, very interesting. And first of all, people don't, just don't get it, you know. Because uh, you think, if you go around and say, well, okay, I've got to be receptive, so what do I do <laughs> to be receptive? I say, well, look, you don't really do anything. But ridiculous, do I just sit around and just twiddle my thumbs and be receptive? No, no, but there is a way of doing it and you catch on and it's, it's a kind of art form. So this is the practicality of it. How do you connect it? Because if there is, and this comes back to what I'm going to get into now, you know, something which I really don't want to avoid in this conversation and that's really religion and God and all of that. Because there is a, a side of all this discussion about higher intelligence, which is an aspect of panpsychism, so to speak, this, this um, enlarged view of nature and uh, uh, how to say it, uh, rather than uh, as uh, we were surrounded by this, as you said about the person speaking about uh, nature and its capacities. But there is this too about reaching for why is there. Uh, a distance between what we take to be ourselves and higher intelligence. Because that's the problem. Why is there this? Why, uh, why does it have to be this distance? Uh, we might get into this. Uh, for the moment, I just follow the little thread saying, well, <clears throat> if there wasn't that distance, then there would be no drama, uh, there would be no point to us at all. <laughs> uh, why is it that, well, let me pause, not pause, but turn to another thing from memory and tradition, that's this old teaching of the great chain of being. Uh, this was the idea, you know, from the lowest to the highest, there must have been a unity, so it's like a chain you know, connecting the lowest to the highest that we happen to be, according to you, placed somewhere along this. So inevitably there must be something above us and something beneath us. And we have this chain connecting us. And that was an idea that Bennett revived in his idea of the uh, scale of essence classes of reciprocal feeding, which he got from Gurdjieff's in the diagram of everything living. You know, everything's so the rocks come into the soil, which goes into the grains, which go into the animals, which goes into people, which then goes into the angels, goes into the cosmic processes. You know, all that organic view of Gurdjieff and so on. But importantly, this is that a fact of our life, let me put it crudely, is that we are a bit stupid. Now, why is that? <laughs> Yes, we evidently are stupid. <laughs> yeah, no, it's the big, it's the big conundrum, and 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 yeah, I just wanted a, a, one thing that that resonated when you when you talked about the difference between the passive will and the active will. This has been one of my sort of the conundrums of my practice. The receptive will, not passive. Receptive will, receptive, receptive. Yes, thanks for that clarification. That's that's all. That makes all the difference. Um, that. When one image I have gotten for the receptive will 
and, and, and cult, that process of cultivation you talk about. Mm. It's a great word because you, you can't make the thing happen. You can't make the, right. the connection happen, but you can sort of build the garden or, or cultivate the, the mind or the, the heart. And for me, the model is like, and you can, you can root this in our, in our own, you know, paleolithic past as nomadic <laughs> hunter gatherers. You know, you imagine people moving across the plains, there's lions, whatever, the band stops and it's nighttime. Well, there's always somebody who's staying up and watching. You know, there's always going to be a watcher for these early bands. And what is the mind of that watcher, you know, who's not distracted by <laughs> telephones or the internet or or then they have very whatever you probably don't even have very much elaborate cosmology they just follow the stars they whatever who knows what kind of minds they had but in any case if you're a watcher and you're a good watcher what do you do you are absolutely attentive mm -hmm. your intelligence is completely wedded to the moment and you're waiting as if something else an entity, a being, a, a pattern of a, a, a creature, a god, is about to come out of the of the brushes. Indeed. And that mind, which is you're holding this empty space of nowness that's just pregnant with possibility, and yet you're not making anything happen, but you're waiting so that when you get that first glimpse, a little eye through the lead, <laughs> a little <laughs> flutter of, of wings, you are there. On, at that moment to, to, to receive that and receive that connection. Oh, that's a, what I hear, uh, receptive will. That's that right. But you know about this, there is a, it's actually a very specific and trained technique in, in, uh, in biological science. Have you ever heard of what's called the naturalist trance? Oh, no. We was looking at it. It's really amazed me. It was, uh, first raised by people like Tinbergen, like Lorenz, second of E. Wilson, especially in his book, um, Biophilia, and a very interesting book because, you know, the love of life, and he always, his whole book is about uh, how the love of life is essential for real understanding. But anyway, naturalist trance, he actually just, you know, you ought to look at it, you can find it. Looking at, because he talks about his own experience, he became an expert in, in um, the ethology of, of ants, that was his speciality, and he would talk about doing and observing it. And these people, in applying this, they see things, behavior, and which nobody's ever seen before. And he describes it beautifully, precisely, so you're sitting down there in their jungle, you know, and you make a kind of imaginary screen, a square like this, and you concentrate on it. You don't put aside, you know, you just keep, but you keep your knowledge and what you expect, you know, here and so on, and you wait. And his description of it is absolutely stunning because it's like then, like it begins to unfold before him. But it, what I like about this school is that they they speak about it in they as you can see they picked up elements from indigenous peoples because they who take drugs to enable them to do that to remain still and attentive. But Wilson and that the Western school have done it without drugs. So, to be able to sit still and not go to sleep is quite something. But so it has an ex explicit discipline in making the the frame. You intend within that frame. You you have to relax yourself. Have a very deep relaxation. So it makes it very very intentional. So I urge you to follow up on the naturalist trance. Very good, very good. It sounds very very resonant with what uh, with what I'm describing. But uh, since we're we have a little, little moment here, I uh, let's bring back up the the question. Uh, of language um, in the same way that I was saying how our body, just the physiological functioning of our body is already this incredible intelligence that we have nothing to, we have nothing to do with. Uh, we're not making it happen. And it's, it's incredibly vital in the same way or a similar way. We as humans can look at language as something that's constituting us. You know, we think, Oh, I'm going to express myself through language. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. I'm going to find myself through language. I'm going to come up with my, if we're writers especially, we, I'm going to come up with my unique way of using language to express oh, something right. new yeah. in the world. Okay, sure, that's fine. But another way of looking at it is like without any request, without any choice, each of us, you know, just as we find ourselves in these 
little baby bodies and pooping and hunger and crying and boobs and whatever. And we didn't ask for it. And here we are just in the same way we're being brought up inside of a particular linguistic universe. And that language is already fully functioning. It's already novelty producing, intelligent, full of echoes and allusions and histories. And we have nothing to do with it. And then it begins to sort of colonize our consciousness it's within that matrix most of the time that we operate, that we find ourselves, we think about things, we make decisions, and it's all borrowed. It's all already there, and it's going to last past us when we die. Like, is that not another marvelous and slightly creepy example of higher intelligence that we deal with every day, but we don't really acknowledge as such? Oh, yes, as I mentioned Vico, and I want to add just what we're doing now. You see, conversation, conversation, <clears throat> for me is is miraculous. It was, uh, there's, you know, this would be helpful, but it's an incident, you know, with, with Mr. Bennett. We were having discussions. So it was great with him because we we could just, you know, explore ideas and things and experience and very free. And <clears throat> somebody asked a naive question of, "Oh, Mr. Bennett, you know, I I refer to something in." How do I know that you can understand it in the same way as me? <clears throat> and he came up with what might seem to be a facile response. He said, <clears throat> that's through conscious energy. Because for him, conscious energy was another of these things which may be come into people and leave them. But in ordinary life, people assume they are already conscious, they have this energy, and then it says it's not true. It comes in occasionally. But <clears throat> he said, the word conscious, consciousness, right, I think was first really introduced by John Locke in the 17th century or 18th century. <clears throat> he was the first person to introduce it into English. What it means, consci conscious, is, it means uh, conscience, is uh, to know together, as you know. And so I've taken it, not in the, sometimes it's taken a psychological sense, consciousness is how you, you put your psyche together, you hold your psyche together, but also between us. And so consciousness is in language. Con so that I led to this, Maybe you, the viewers would take it to the spirit's conclusion. The language is essentially conscious itself. <laughs> that is, as you were applying in your introduction here, that we are conscious and we just pick up these things as tools. You know, I hate this word tool. You know, it's a thing, inert thing I can use because I'm intelligent and it's going to obey my will. No, it's, it's already there ahead of us. And so this... And I go back to then the religious example of the extraordinary emphasis in that period of the Age of Revelation, which includes what I call the monotheistic religions in particular, but also involved in some way Buddha. Uh, Age of Revelation is all about uh, the word. You notice it. Judaism, Christianity, Islam, especially Islam, you get the revelation with you talk just now about, you know, you get into a non-verbal state of consciousness. That's true. But the, in that period, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, you know, this kind of thing. This identification of the Word with God was actually, a, that was the key revelation, if you know what I mean. And it's what you're talking about now, it's a phenomenology. And you can then get uh, puzzled about this, who made it, but one part of who made it, I want to throw in here hastily, I'm afraid, is to do with getting away from, because there are sort of top-down explanations, spiritual explanations for this, but there's another component which is more organic and natural, and that's because of conversation. You know, it's just this, you know, language grows out of conversation. It grows out of being used. You see, it doesn't yeah. have to be imparted from above, but once something started, it naturally grows. And so this is the other side of our human experience for me, Eric, I mean, which is very, it was heartbreaking at the time, this antagonism, disintegration, disruption, xenophobia, and all these things you say about it. But there's also the miracle which is available so that every hand, like talking to you, I mean, we have different views, different eyes, different experiences. I don't know if you, what images in your mind, or mind. We're having this conversation. That means we're in the same world. Yes. Yeah, that's miraculous. I mean, people want the miracles. Here it is. You no, know? wow. 
And that's the receiving organ, <laughs> yeah, conversation. Very much so. No, I love that idea of the, of the emergence uh, of language through human interaction. And then it, you know, it grows and grows until it's essentially has a life of its own that changes us and we change it. And, and the, but there's a relation, relationality there. And one way of looking at the importance of the logos or the, the word in these revealed traditions is that, you know, for better or worse, human beings are, st- are clearly uh, intimately involved in the evolution of the planet, at least in this point in the game. And maybe not always to the benefit of the planet, but leaving that aside, that if, the, if we see that happening on a larger scale, that at some point this in some ways deeply human construct, though not exclusively human, animals mm-hmm. have their own forms of language and things, but you know, oh, we've yeah. got our own twist on it. Uh, it's clearly com- complex and, and, and very rich, that at a certain point, the very force of evolution of, of life enters into that field and it becomes lively, it becomes aware and awake. Um, and I think it's really key that distinction you drew between the, the, the resistance to the idea of the, the tool that we come up in this technological society. Right. They want us to think in terms of the tool. They want us to think of language as a tool. Like, oh, it, we used it back in the day to coordinate human social behavior so we could da 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 da. And you're like, <laughs> oh, man, the, first, the first time we coordinated anything, somebody made a joke or they sang a song or they sang a song together. Oh, right on. Yeah. I like to tell you the truth. You know, <laughs> the play is already in there. And, uh, and that's where this whole kind of poetics becomes really important. Like even though poetry is, can be seen as sort of a, 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 a an effete, uh, useless side. Oh, practice. no, 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 no. no, no, no. <laughs> the poets are the antennae of the antenna of the, of the race that somebody yes. said. That was. Yeah, that was, um, uh, that was Pound said that. Andrew Pound, good old Andrew yeah. in spite of being, he was anti-Semitic, but what yes. incredible insights he had. Uh, but okay, we, I'm just looking at the clock now. I think I'm I'm really getting anxious, Eric, because we got so much. We could go on for ten hours at least. And say, oh my God! We'll, we just, uh, we'll enjoy our hour. Oh all right. I just I was just looking at some of my old um, articles about uh, I wrote about Bennett and his ideas, and he was a uh, it's a shifting gear rather you know proponent of what he called demiurgic intelligence. Uh, yeah, what did he mean by that? You know, the word demiurge, it, it goes back to the Greeks. Uh, you can find it in the writings of Plato and Aristotle. And it was, in a way, in a nutshell, I could say first definition is it was higher intelligence involved in the fabrication of the universe. So it was the maker. Uh, so you can imagine it, uh, it's a very rough kind of operation, but you've got, it's, you see, that the word angel, is, you know, derives from the meaning messenger. But the demiurge is a worker, and sometimes they even translate it as a worker for the people. Uh, but a worker, and clearly Bennett would attach himself more to the worker, being in the work and all this kind of thing, is, as being productive and active and, and doing something. But this came into our Western civilization culture as, as I say, the craftsman, and it was, it was very interesting because in the literature, the story, so to speak, there was always, not always, but implicit or around, there was embedded in it somehow this kind of distinction. You see, the demiurge is the creator, but he or it works with already existing material. So in tradition, he is represented by the potter. And all the old stories about a potter are really stories about the demiurge because he's the fastener. And, and this is going back to other things we can't go into, how the making of pots was absolutely drastically important in human life, you know, because it was re- regarded as sacred. It was amazing. But he said that we got into the age of revelation to with the word and see what happens there. Uh, you start with nothing. And this is incredible part of a change in the human thought. There was a time people always started with something, so the demiurge was a super being, the the super craftsman who made things, because they saw people making things. So so we made the universe. Then they said, oh, that's not it, because who made the material? 
you know, you've got to go deeper than that. So they came up with this, which is, uh, it is the <coughs> creation out of nothing. And that they became divine. That is the truly divine. This is the truly spiritual. And the religion knows then had this battle about you get into the cross from the demiurge. She is it's a lesser thing. Then this, and I'm rushing to try to put this in. I'm trying to restrain myself. It'd be nice to be careful about this. <laughs> I did mention last time too, these, what, all this play between these two forces in which you know, like there is the, the creator in Gnosticism is uh, a tyrant who has enclosed us in his dream. You see. And compassion of God is beyond that. And so the Gnostics have to wake up to the dream world created by the tyrant uh, to encounter the savior or the higher woman, the higher intelligence, you see, and then be free into the compassion. So this is a bit of a meander around this idea of the demiurge, but it's definitely this intermediary stage. And to impose on you a little bit more, I was just refresh my mind that but and in Gurdjieff and in Bennett, I mean Gurdjieff makes a joke about it in some sense, or the archangels and so on. Uh, but Bennett has a similar view. They that intelligence can only be concerned with the generality. So say in terms of human evolution, if we accept some kind of agency like this, it's only concerned with the evolution, so to speak, of the species and the biosphere. But what belongs properly to religion is beyond that, and it's exemplified by the thing in Matthew, it says, not a sparrow falls, but that the Lord thy God knoweth it. Now that's the infinite God, and it's not the demiurge. Yeah. But Bennett still said, we're on this planet in these conditions, in this crisis, and we need the demiurgic intelligence. Right. Well, we certainly seem to have, have minted them. I mean, you know, I'm glad you actually, the, the sort of Gnostic cosmology popped up because it's something that comes up again and again on the podcast. And I know mm. for a lot of my listeners, um, it's a very powerful model. And it's one, one of the reasons it's so powerful is that in, in our sort of contemporary crisis moment, uh, one of the best analogies I think we have for, let's say, the role that corporations play, not only in uh. organizing the world, but in shaping our minds and our perceptions, the role of uh, artificial, growing role of artificial intelligence, you know, talk about another kind of intelligence. Oh, yes. How do we think about these things? So there's, there's definitely a, an archonic dimension or a demiurgic dimension to to our reality, and yet I agree with you in the sen in the same way that that you know, uh, short of a of a civilizational collapse where some people manage to survive and return to the old ways in some manner, that before we get to that point, there's still something about the capacity for a collective engineered intelligence to deal with problems, and I do think that that is still a possibility. It's just there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of other you know, it's a, it's a it's a war of demiurges or a, a struggle, an agon oh. of, uh, of of demiurges out there. So I think it's 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 quite wonderful you brought uh, you brought up that. In fact, even that that very passage I was reading today of, of, about the sparrows. Oh, really? Uh, and, and that distinction between um, the, the 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 singularity, you know, of the person, and and I think that's a, a really important part of conversation because if conversation is an actual creative engine a, a, a forge of novelty a, 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 an element of an emerging higher mind then it then a conversation it, it's always about these singularities that are engaging these personalities with their own unique histories and so that means that you can't just take the general view because we're not as personalities and as conversationalists, we're not just subservient to these larger patterns. We are also involved in weaving that higher mind through our own singularity, the engagement of our singularities through language and affect and, and emotion. So, oh God, you always set me off. I mean, just, it's kind of like going to love, I'm, I'm drowning you. It's just incredible because uh, one of the things I was throwing about this in, 
in your description, you know, I mean, it's coming up with words we use and so on. It's all part of this. It's not that our words are right or true or anything, but just this, it's, this, is, this is the action, this languaging and so on. But I want to we just mention, in terms of energies, is my calling on Bennett's uh, terminology, you know, difference between the creative and the unitive energy, because that's the whole point about the damage is created, but uh, beyond the image is love. And Ben called it more abstractly unitive energy, but it's very, it's very peculiar properties. And you know, intellectually, you could study it, but it's a very, very hard and subtle thing. And you need something like Ibn Arabi to help you uh, to, to grasp it, because it means this, this incredible um, acceptance of, of individuality everywhere, where you don't put it into a blob. You know, and that's for us impossible. That's why love is impossible. You know, and where it's reflected in human life is usually a degenerate form of it. So there's uh, definitely that. Then, as you were speaking, that's the other thing I want to throw in. It's just an incredible moment. This is a fantasy came into my mind, but I'm just reporting it. So it's looking there's Eric, me, and we're talking, and I say, so, well, Eric could disappear, I could disappear, but the conversation could go on. <laughs> I said, I really felt that. You know, it's because people think the solid thing is Eric and the solid thing is Tony, or we're actually over here. Um, but I think, well, the really solid thing is the conversation. <laughs> and, but this is interesting because I think this is uh, emerging in physics. And uh, just to refer, I don't know if you see the book, but it's quite a useful reference for having information and nature reality. All right, Paul and Davies. Paul, you know Paul Davies, of course, lovely chap. But um, I was really struck I got it just out of, oh, I ought to read it, and I started reading it. And I looked at the end, and there you got an essay at the end by a theologian talking about the body of Christ. And I thought, what the, what the, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, it's, it's like the, the real, I mean, say, for me, what I call the real spiritual people, in a sense, fighting back in all of this, and all this stuff which they've been cowering and pretend, you know, we, we're not really like, we don't really believe in all this stuff about the resurrection and, you know, going up into heaven and all this stuff. And, but thank God, you know, it's like a weird thing without being too stupid about this. All this, the modern physics has come along and provided tools for people to start thinking in that way. Yeah. Well, or or at least inviting people to to recognize how open ended things are. I mean, if you do, even if you're very very careful, very skeptical, very resistant to the the way that religious thought can come into science, um, and that's a whole relationship we could talk more about oh, another absolutely. time. But uh, that it's nonetheless, it, the physics is so weird now. There's so many enormous unsolved problems. Uh, there's so much uh, sort of tension between different kinds of models that it, you have no choice but to sort of realize that we're, we're, we're still kind of making it up as we go along. And there may be another turn where we come to some sort of unified th field theory, or, but it may not. It may not really work out that way and mm -hmm. what it means to be human and paying attention and using your intelligence <laughs> even in the more uh, everyday sense of the that's, term. That's absolutely right. To recognize how open, how open it is. Yeah, if people, you know, if somebody really understands and are intelligent, then they, they got it all worked out. They got a system and everything's harmonious and in place. I think below that, you know, that's, no, that's a deception. Because they're all, you know, people are still attracted to this top-down authoritarian blueprint worked out, everything in its place. You know, and that's the sign of authority. And we see the fascist leaders all around the world uh, acting on that basis. But we know the real human life, the wet and dirty life, is um, this seemingly chaos, but not chaos. It's life. It's more than life. It's creation all the time. And you're looking at the watch. I'm running out of time here. It's awful. I really want to <laughs> no, 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 when you talk about it, it makes it worse. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> But, no, we, yeah, we do. We have like eight minutes. Yeah, I really do believe it. Because this, you see, this is, this is what we're doing now. You see, what, does it get anywhere? You know, <laughs> what are these people getting up, voicing their opinions. What's the point of that? And I think it matters desperately. Because, you know, it's matters desperately because it's, it's like being in a current. Um, I'm, I'm 
search for metaphors, being, what we say, being in the flow in all of that thing. But that's, just, that's, that's the real thing. Uh, and, and you see all the archaic tendencies of, of to want to put up dams, you know, to um, get hydroelectric power and those sort of images we get a bit. They're using you know, the flow tool. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. As a tool, and then we make something, and we've got something, and it's ours, and it's not yours, and all that kind of stuff. And so they say, just enjoy the play, you know, where I always say the old fashioned now English sentiment play up, play up, the game's the thing. You know? Now people say, oh no, winning is the thing. You know, we're not interested in the game for itself. You say, no, fuck that. <laughs> I'm totally with you. Yeah. Game, like we want to, I want to join a game, so we're trying to find somebody we can play a game. And you say, well, it's a bit irresponsible. But no, I don't think because the game is, I don't know where the word game comes from. Gamos, the, uh, it's like a flex, it's like, I don't know, flexing the universe. <laughs> yeah, because the uh, one thing I saw, I feeling I inherited from Bennett was that, you know, existence itself is far more flexible than it looks. <laughs> the first uh. Yeah. That was one of his ideas. Yeah, yeah. Um, he says, um, I could say, uh, well, it's, to put it in an exaggerated way, you know, reality is up for grabs. Yeah, yeah. No one captures the flag. Uh, and it's an interesting um, point when you have that mind frame and, uh, and you see the growth of, of totalitarian thought or I'm right, you're wrong, or, you know, the, the, the certainty, the spread of certainty. And, and, it, and I have to say, it, it is kind of getting worse in some ways um, in terms of how people, everybody feels like they have to act like they know what's going on. Like, ah. I, mean, I, I was reading something today where, where someone was, 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 was making fun of the news and just how news functions. And one of the things they were saying is like, it's, a, it's extraordinary. You never hear... Uh, uh, you know, a news person go. You know, we we I, I, we don't know. It's really confusing. It's very complicated. It's really hard to figure out. I I, I just don't really know. Exactly. You know, you like you never hear that. And politicians and politicians, they don't even. They could even just do both sides. They don't even have to say I don't know because that freaks everybody out. They could just say, well, we could levy this tax uh, and produce more revenue for X and Y. But the problem is, is when you do that. Then you also, you know, create this other drag, uh, or or the poor people have to do it. So it's it's actually kind of a hard decision to make because there's winners and losers, and that's reality. But politicians that is, can't say that. So can. we're constantly fed this idea that we're supposed to know that we know what we that we know, and that you go out there and you combat other people who know what they know, and that's that's the world. And then there's people like us, and we're like, well, I can't, I can't even interact with that. Uh, you know? And yet we, it feels like we're doing something by keeping this openness alive, by this, oh, this multiplicity, this creativity. It, it, it isn't just two dudes riffing. It's like, it's like making available a space which um, isn't owned by anybody. That's beautiful. A, yes. That's, that's, well, you're just hearing to just uh, this picture that you, you think it's not, but it's very precious because everywhere, everything gets possessed and labeled. And, but, very true. Very true. Very true. This is it. Really. But uh, what is it to. Well, what did Bennett. What did. Uh, oh, go ahead. No, no, you, you please ask me. No, no, I was just going to say what, how, what Bennett had or, or, or what teachings you picked up from him and that, that uh, were practices to help cultivate this uh, receptive will, this, this mind that's open for the creative moment. What, what, what sort of things did you draw from that that were, you know, things you could pass on or, or practices? Well, the practices are such a practices sort of be transmitted in a corresponding way. There were what we call inner exercises um, of various kinds he had. Uh, uh, these, in a way, these exercises are, uh, what do you call it? they provide, well, it's not quite the right, but they, they provide taste. They give you an introduction. Uh, yeah. But, that's, but the, the other thing is this cultivation of attitude, and it's difficult to put a name on it, because it's not, again, 
it's a bit like tool. You see, what's the technique for doing this? And I think, uh, yeah, that, yeah. you know what I mean? It's not, it's not really a technique, it's a cultivation. It's a weak word, I'm so apologized for it. But it's this, this way of appreciating everything in a different way and having these conversations and so on is, is to do with recognizing that one doesn't know. Uh, it's, it's, um, as I told you, I, I think I may have mentioned it last time, as it was a great moment in my life when I, I uh, joined, joined the School of Ignorance, <laughs> so to speak, which was a natural school, and I began to embrace ignorance and see it as a power and, and all the rest of it. So it's to, it's because the way, you know, from Goethe and so on, as, and Bennett, as a sister, is very strange, is to be very careful. About it. It's just a way of understanding. Uh, and techniques are always secondary. You have to uh -huh, see the point. Uh -huh. Now, like your first kind of uh, men, uh, words, you know, the beginning of all this about sitting here, sitting there, and, and so on. You see, well, there is uh, an issue which is to do this, which is what you've been hinting all the way to recognize that one doesn't know. And this recognition one doesn't know is actually releases a sort of finer energy. It's not just sitting down, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, go, I don't know, why not? Oh, oh. No, it's just, you see, it's the way it's going to be, you see, you don't know. And in seeing you don't know, you begin to move. It's just amazing, it's just, it's just absolutely extraordinary. So, in a way, it's part of the via neg negativa, because it's a very, very big thing. And so you begin to give up. It doesn't sound like much. You give up one's habits of knowing and pretending and putting on a front and playing a role and putting on a mask and blah, 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 and, you know, paving one's face. And you're, you're prepared to be humiliated and embarrassed and all of that. Because that's ultimately, there's very hard moral things he Ben was on about. He said, this is the way of humiliation. And people say, well, what? I don't want any of that. <laughs> no. I want to know how to get mind power and so on. But right back, it goes back to one fundamental thing of Gurdjieff, which I think was implicit, but maybe I was praying to you, Eric, you let me speak to you again. Um, this uh, fundamental statement of Gurdjieff, which I get, I read it, I go, what? And I read it again, I go, what? And I read it again, I go, what? Uh, and it's where he said, you know, what you call consciousness is not consciousness, is not real. The yeah. real consciousness is what you call the subconsciousness. And he bloody well meant it. You know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, you know what? I, I'm really glad you came, you left that little gnomic phrase there because that's just going to be the little, the little seed or the grit and the pearl that we'll leave with, with our listeners and that I'll take on myself. This conundrum, what if consciousness, what we mean by consciousness is not conscious at all. Just that alone is a, is, is a good dig. So, uh, Tony, thanks again for talking to us and Expanding Mind. It was totally fun. Bless you. And thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, folks. Till next week. Keep your minds open. Hey there. Hello. Is it Hi there. Well, so, you know, what I'm doing right now is I'm, I'm when I'm done with the conversation, that's, that's going to go out on the podcast. But then I'm... I'm having a brief little after uh, out of that whole conversation. What, what did you want to say? What, what was the, was there a point that was missed? Was there some image coming through that you really felt you needed to say? Oh God, it was so much. Uh, <laughs> <pick up> any, <laughs> it's like spiking out. Let me just try and reflect a moment. It was the, uh, absolutely. I did, uh, <sighs> cause It's that part of it where I'm not going to say, well, I, I will want to speak about this because it's an area of importance. And again, I got from Bennett and my story about it was he, because when I knew him and towards the end of his life, he was, had various projects or things he wanted to really impart to people. And one of them was that, uh, he expressed that we should learn to communicate with higher intelligence. Now, this is, uh, you know, in the modern age, of course, it could be various according to who listens to this. Some people say, of course, I communicate with higher intelligence. I'm on the phone with them every day. You know, I write books about it, you know. Uh, 
But my take on it was very, very different. As I remember going to a group and he talked about this, he said to me afterwards, what do you think about that, Tony? And I said to him, I think it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. Because uh, you could talk to him like that, you know, you didn't worry, because I was true. But then I thought at that moment, oh my God, I condemn myself because I opened my mouth on that and I'm stuck with it. So I'm still stuck with it. Because <laughs> how to do it, and this is, you know, people ask me how to do it in various ways and uh, things you can point to, like you, Goethe is saying, and then again, so you, you must do everything you can and then say, God have mercy. I love Gurdjieff. He's so radical, <laughs> so concrete. Yeah, yeah, like, definitely. Uh, well, I thought one, one thing that was interesting was, uh, I, I guess my question that I, that I had wanted to ask is, if we talk about higher intelligence mm -hmm. as either a capacity that we have, perhaps individually, perhaps collectively, mm -hmm. that is sort of an overtone of, of our consciousness or our Yeah, our yeah, yeah. And yet at the same time, we'll look in the history of religion or the history of esotericism or even in modern ufology, and we see this sort of need to externalize and kind of mythologize or poeticize higher intelligence as outside beings, like, you know, the, 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 the sacred chiefs or, you know, the great white brotherhood or you know, the esoteric Rosicrucian order on another planet or higher intelligence from other planets. And what um, is the relationship between our kind of immediate potential to communicate with higher intelligence in that sense and this kind of mythology or, or these figures of the imagination that take on reality within a lot of con you know situations mm. that we find in religion we find in in esoteric orders we find in occult ideas we find in even in ufology what what do you think is the relationship between those two different kinds of higher intelligences in a way well it's well, i take it well first of all uh, this is have you ever come across this book can you see it literature and the gods by i know his work but i don't know that one because he said, you know, even nowadays we don't, well, when he wrote, that we don't talk about the gods, where have they gone? Then he insists that they are in, in literature. They have to be in literature. And George Steiner has a similar idea. The gods haven't disappeared. They're in, the, in within the story. But to answer your question, I would answer it this way, as far as I can answer it. Now, and it's to do with being immersed in these kind of ideas of levels of the psyche of man and so on. And so there's a, that, um, all to do with the images belongs to a, a certain level, a certain world, and this world, Bennett's got you know, the reactional self, it's the astral world, it's the world of air and so on. Uh, the, the third world is, uh, doesn't, is beyond images. And in that, you get a, that's the real place of understanding. So the images are there to uh, communicate with us at that level so to speak, there is another level. In theosophy, the third level is the causal level, the second level is the astral, and then there's a physical level. You see that kind of thing. So, so that's how I treat it. Now there's realm I'm hoping to look at a bit in my forthcoming seminar about um, actually called Movements of the Soul. But, but I'm bringing some elements from Bennett's extraordinary writings about the sacred images and the role they play because there is a way of doing this intentionally, dealing with the, uh, dealing with the images. But there, because he did it from the point of view of being very conscious about what he was doing, not just accepting them, reificating them, because he says more or less the essence of it. You get involved in creating this image, but this image turns out to be more than we are. You know, and that's the mystery of the sacred image. That's that's the art of the sacred image. And to, mm -hmm. it's not like believing them at all, you know, because you are actively involved in it. That's the best I can do on this. No, that's good. What, which text is that where he talks about that? Well, there's the, um, there is a book on, called Sacred Influences, one yeah. of books, which is in there where he talks about the sacred image. No, that's a big theme in the uh, in this Changing light at Sandover that I'm that I'm reading. Oh, right okay. Now. Well, I'm just Eric. I, I must chide you. I must chide you. 
you haven't read my book. I know I got to get going. It's terrible, man. It's so, I deserve the chiding. <laughs> you got to find your little mountain with a little, I don't know, little um, cafe at the top of the mountain. So you get your espresso or whatever it is you drink. <laughs> It'll happen. It'll happen soon. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm inspired I because I, I can tell it's a theme. Like I, this, this has been coming up this whole year. Uh, so it's, it's, be, it's sort of become a theme that I wasn't even aware of. And uh, when you ping me about, about having another podcast, I was like, you know, something's in the air. And so I, you know, I just wanted to be honest about it and not kind of pretend. Uh, so I'm, you know, I, oh, like was, I love it because this is see, uh, you know, how horrible the world is. Everybody pretending all the time, you know, it's like, the kind of example of its significance to me, because I've been involved, I love fostering dialogue and so on. And often the dialogue, which is, is pretty boring and tedious, are going around. And I'm sitting there, and then somebody says, I'm fed up with this, it's so boring, it's not getting anywhere. And my immediate reaction is, oh God, they're being negative. You see? But what happens phenomenologically, almost inevitably, is that the whole thing turns around. Why? Because somebody had just given an ordinary, straightforward, honest expression of what they felt. That's all. That's all it takes. And all the rest uh -huh. of it was this, this maneuvering, this, this portrayal, this fiction. You don't realize it. What's called, what we're called upon to do is so simple. It's not coming up with a great revelation. But I've done it myself. I said, I'm, I'm really, you know, I'm really sick. I've just got this kind of, irritation in me or something. I just talked about my petty emotions. It was so liberating because people are trained, you know, like Gurdjie groups and so on. They're all trained to come up with wonderful, meaningful observations and all the rest of it. That makes it a waste of time. It's a total waste of time. And somebody comes up and says, you know, uh, I'm, I'm crabby today. And I really, it was like, well, I was in a dialogue once um, with a, a friend, you know, in a long time. And she suddenly said, you know, I hated everybody in the room then. I said, why didn't you say it? Then, you know how you're saying it, you see? But that's yeah. the thing. Because somebody speaks a truth. It doesn't have to be a cosmic truth. A truth. Any truth. That saves the situation. Yeah. And people don't realize they're not saying the truth. They're all trying to look good. I'm trying to look good. Uh, yeah. Instead of saying, I'm... And you're not going to the object. Oh, I'm a miserable worm. No, just... I want to take my nose, you know. Someone was telling me that, that there are a lot of young people uh, today, you know, you know, Instagram, one of these social media yeah. net networks, that they, ha they often have two accounts. They have their sort of uh, public account where everything's going well and, and that's under their real name and they're oh. doing great and everything is like upbeat and like, look at this cool thing I'm doing and hey, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And then they have another account that's pseudonymous that only their close friends know about because you can't really track it as, as well because you, there's no name that you can recognize. And that's where they share all this like really, often really dark stuff, obsession, yes. this and that, or we you know. Absolutely. And because they can't, there's like now in that social media world, that, that mask has been hardened as the self in a way as that's your identity that's your name it's your photograph it's where you are it's the whole thing but then beneath it there's all this other stuff where there's something that's you know probably more honest in some ways but also just a more holistic picture of the being that needs to get split into these two different streams because that uh, so called wrong stuff is often the most kind of being stuff there is you know and i I get annoyed at the groups that say because there's pretense about their superiority and so on. Because you, it's good to give what you can about. All, all you've got is what you've got. And it, it's just, this is just your stuff. And you've got to work with your stuff, whatever the stuff is, because there isn't anything else to work with. Everything else is just virtual reality. <laughs> and it's not the. Yeah. You know? Well, yeah, if you try to be somebody else, you're just going to do a bad job. I mean, the only, the only thing you have a choice at being, a chance at being really good at being is yourself. Yeah, right. I'll <laughs> mention that. Yes, I'll mention it's that. It's so obvious. It took me 50 years to figure that out. But you Doesn't know. it take you a long time? Because you, you look back and you use, you're always trying to be better, to look good, be, you know. I still remember the time, well, just a little 
dimmer when I was about 20 or something. I still I remember this conscious moment with a guy, he asked me a question, and I said, I don't know. And at that moment, there was this consciousness that said, I said, I don't know. It's the first time I ever said, I don't know. You know? Can you believe that? <laughs> and I thought, that was the beginning of my conscience. That was... Oh, yeah. Very well, that's a great... Yeah, yeah. You know what? I think uh, that's a good note to, to end on. I think we'll Okay, man, you've got to do up. stuff. Okay. Tony, it was great to talk God to you. Us. Well, so I put in a petition for another session when you can... <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. For sure. Well, good luck with your, your upcoming stuff. Amen. Bye-bye. Okay.